Good morning. Well, we're now on the uh, series of the miracles through the Bible, and this is uh, lesson 10. And the title is, Are You on the Right Side of God? We're going to be taking a look at the miracle of the pillar of cloud and fire that led Israel after the Exodus. So title, Are You on the Right Side of God? So we're going to go to Exodus 13, verse 21. Like I said, so we're going to take a look at the miraculous formation of the pillar of cloud and fire that guided and protected the nation of Israel after their exodus from Egypt. Exodus 13, 21. By day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. So here we see this incredible uh, miracle of God, a cloud by day. And when you look up pictures, it seems almost like a whirlwind, you know, because, I mean, you've got uh, over a million people. So it's not like a little fluffy cloud. You know what I mean? It's a serious cloud for people to see. And then this thing turns into fire. I mean, imagine watching it go from, you know, maybe that's what the kids did. They waited, you know, as the sun went down to watch it go from cloud to fire. I mean, you know, like how we like to do sunrises and sunsets. I mean, that would have been something. And it guided the Israelites during their exodus from the Egyptian bondage. So from exodus, whenever the Israelites made camp, the cloud would descend and cover the tabernacle looking like fire at night. When it lifted up again, they would set out on the next stage of their journey with the cloud leading the way. That's why I sort of have this image of it being a bit like a whirlwind, because it's moving. Sometimes the cloud will remain a long time over the tabernacle, sometimes only from evening until morning. Whether it lingered for two days, a month or a year, the Israelites would not break camp until the cloud lifted up and moved on. So every day there's was, there was this real intent, are we going, are we not? This real attitude of, I don't know where I will be tomorrow. I don't know. And you imagine all those emotions of, you know, well, it hasn't moved for a month, maybe we're going to stay here a bit longer, and then just when you get settled. All those temptations of, maybe we should make the tent a little bit more stable, a little bit more permanent. All those temptations we feel like, as a Christian, well, am I going to stay in this city, in this church for this period? Maybe I just need a few more things to make my home great, and then boom, you're gone. Right. Not only that, um, Moses would have not known the very place to take God's people mm-hmm. at the very place, at the very best time. See, while Moses may have had a small knowledge of the area because he came back from Midian, um, he would have really known where to take this one million plus people. Like today, leaders should look to God to guide them and protect them and their people. We should not rely on our own wisdom. It's good to make plans, but always with the knowledge that God's will is what we are seeking. Yeah. Proverbs sixteen nine: In their hearts, humans plan their course. But the Lord established their steps. We need plans. Absolutely, we plans. We pl- if you aim at nothing, you get nothing. nothing. Yeah. But to think your plans are God's plans. Mm-hmm. Well, the longer you are, <laughs> the more you realize, the longer you're a disciple, the longer you remember that. That just ain't it. Yeah. God leads us. God leads through us. And he leads despite us. Uh, we need to be reliant on him. Reliant on his word and our obedience to his word is what makes all the difference. When we rely on God and we obey God, that's the bit that makes the difference. It's not what we do so much as our attitude. You know, the pillar was not just symbolism, but the real phenomenon. It's funny, I was watching, you know, reading all these uh, documentaries and, uh, and commentaries on it. And he said, well, you know, when Alexander the Great had an army, he had this, you know, uh, brazier of, of light, um, like, a, like a fire amongst his tent. 
Yeah, but that was for 10,000 people. 20,000 people. We're talking 1 million. There's no way a little fire at the middle of a tent on that sort of size could have done it. Mm. Matt always wants to justify, well, I don't think it was a miracle. It was an absolute miracle. During the day, the pillar guided their journey. During the night, it gave them light. And no doubt, it also comforted them. You know, you can be comforted by God, and you can be disturbed by God. But the only reason why we're disturbed by God is when we resist God. In addition to the guidance for the Hebrews, the pillar was a testimony to other nations around them concerning God's involvement with and the protection of his people. God was with them. I mean, there were times when, you know, people came and checked out this large body of Israelites. And when, you know, even the Egyptians came up and said, let's have a look at the Israelites. Where are they all gone? And then you see this massive pillar and they're like, geez, there's something different about these people. God's provision of the pillar was remembered in the prayer of the Jewish leaders in Nehemiah 9 as an instance of God's care and provision for his people. Nehemiah 9.12 says, By day you led them with a pillar of cloud and by night with a pillar of fire to give them light on their way they were to take. So even throughout history, we remember this God. We remember right from the beginning of the Exodus. You were always there to guide us and protect us. Is that how you feel about your relationship with God? He's there to guide and protect. Or do you feel like right now, I feel like God's got it in for me. In Exodus 14, 24, God had acted out his protection on the Egyptians through the cloud. So in Exodus 14, 24 says, During the watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. Now, miraculous clouds and fire indicate God's presence. When the Israelites arrive at Mount Sinai, the cloud covers the mountain and Moses enters into it to receive the commandments. To the observers below, the cloud appears as a devouring fire on top of the mountain. Remember, but Moses is going into this thing. In Exodus 19, 18, Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed it up from it like smoke from a furnace. And the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpets grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and the voice of God answered him. I mean, what an incredible sight. There's fire, there's smoke, and there's Moses walking in. And everybody's like, whoa, what is happening? God is among us. I mean, you really felt the presence of God. Later, after the tabernacle or the tent of meeting had been constructed... The pillar of cloud descended to the entrance of the tent, where God talks with Moses face to face. Exodus 40, 34. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting, because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. It was present at the temple. 1 Kings 8, when the, uh, verse 10. When the priest withdrew from the holy place, The cloud filled the temple of the Lord, and the priests could not perform their services because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled his temple. I mean, they were literally enabled by the cloud. They couldn't do anything. I think that's a great metaphor for us. You know what? When God is in us, it's like we do nothing. And when God is not with us, it's like we have to do everything. I think about um, when Daniel went back to uh, Africa. Shouldn't have done it two, three months. We couldn't do anything. And yet what happened? One of the person out of the ICOC came and said, I want to be restored. The brothers from South Africa go up there. And who is it? It's Daniel's uncle. He's kept faithful by the Lord. In the presence of God today, the presence of God today is the Holy Spirit. Given at baptism to guide and protect us, as we know in Acts 2.38. It can be taken away from an individual and a whole church. Just like God abandoned Israel due to its hard heart. We have to understand the early church was set up by the apostles. They did miracles. They were the greatest leaders we had. The foundation was Jesus Christ himself. And yet in Revelation 2.4 it says, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. 
Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstands from his place. It wasn't like they weren't doing anything. It's like they weren't doing the things at first. So even we had this lesson on Sunday night, right, about greed. Who was it that gave the extra money? The young Christians. Did anybody in this room give any extra money? You know what? That's what you would have done when you first got baptized. Oh, we're in the ministry now. I know I'm going to do my special. They were just simply moved. When was the last time you were just simply moved? Have you become so religious that you stopped having your heart moved by the word of God? You know, God being with you is a result of you being with him. It should be obvious to all around you that his spirit working miracles in you and your ministry. Just like with Daniel, it's like, we didn't do anything, it was all God. It is that what's happening in your ministry. Things are just happening, not because of you, but because of God. Based on that assumption, would you say you and God are on the same page? If not, why not? When I read all these victories in the Bible, it's not about the work, is it? It's about God intervening. Oh, there may be a plan that they have to obey, like Jericho or whatever. But nobody at Jericho stood against the wall and went, look what I did. No one. You see, is God with you today? Not what are you doing, but is God with you? Point number one, are you being led by God? Are you willing to go where the Spirit of God leads you? Matthew 4, 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The Spirit of God does not take us where we think it should most of the time. <laughs> we do not dream of times in the wilderness. That's not what we dream of. Yet when we hold on to our dreams of what we think God should or should not do for us or to us, we will always have an anger or smoldering bitterness in our soul. To be led by the Spirit, we must be devoted to the Word of God. Disciples struggle to be led by the Spirit because they do not know how the Spirit actually works, as shown in the Bible. They just think they know how it works. You know, too often when people go, I believe God's doing this to me. We, we try and, and we know it's not true. We try and have a discussion with people. Why don't we just simply say, can you show me that in the Bible? I know when I meet non-Christians, they go, well, I believe that you're saved by faith alone. I say, can you show me a scripture that actually says you're saved by faith alone? Well, no. I said, you know why? Because there isn't one. That's the only way to combat our disciples. People go, I feel like God doesn't love me. You want to show me a scripture that says God doesn't love you? God loves everybody. That's not the issue. The issue is, do we love God? Yeah. Jesus started his ministry not with glory, fame, or success, but pain. Yeah. Nearly all of you are at the start of your ministry life. No, oh, I've been in it three years. You're at the start of your ministry life. You should, not, you should be buying into the understanding of no short-term pain, no long-term gain. Yeah. And short-term pain is years. It's not weeks. It's not month. It's years. You know, when I was growing up, I had what was called growing pains. Mm -hmm. I remember I would be screaming on my bed at night. And I remember because my mum would put corks from wine bottles underneath my bed. I don't know if it's an old wives' tale. What I do know is it worked. Whether it's in the cork, whether it's in the not making you comfortable... Who knows what it is? But the way to get past my growing pains was to put me into more discomfort, not in comfort. I think about all my time in the UK, all Kerry's time in the UK. We never saw the end goal. The end goal had nothing to do with the UK. It was to prepare us for our present time in Austral China. Israel had to walk around the desert for 40 years before they were ready to follow God obediently. God is willing to discipline people for a long time to get them obedient. 
You have to understand, sometimes the blessings of God will only come when you understand that they will not come unless you are obedient. Has somebody bring, bringing up with you the same character sin for the last week, month, year, two years? It's not going to change <laughs> unless you change. When we focus on the unfairness of the here and now, we have stopped seeing God in our lives. We become entitled to something God never promised, comfort. It should shock us into the reality of just how out of tune with God we are. Too many people are led by the wounds, their wounds, rather than the spirit. So they avoid going into a place where they will get more wounds. It is taking on wounds for others that heals them. 1 Peter 2, 4, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. It is by your wounds that you heal your ministry. Either by giving you the experience of it. Like I can count to people that have a broken relationship in the kingdom and dating because of I have two broken relationships. But also, I can also counsel people that have been hurt inside the kingdom because I've been massively abused inside the kingdom. And therefore, it helps me be a better counsellor. You may follow the Spirit, but do you do so willingly, happily, with great overflowing gratitude in your soul? Hebrews 12, 7. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? I was with Keanu the other day, and I said, how are you feeling about everything? And so, oh, I said, well, just read Hebrews 12. I said, when was the last time you read Hebrews 12? I said, I don't know, a year ago. I read it. He just read it and started giggling. He went, ow. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because a breaking up relationship, it's like, you've got to understand, this is all part of God loving you. Mm-hmm. Romans 8, 14. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Mm-hmm. You put those two passages together, it's like, Hardship, discipline, led by God, children of God, spirit of sonship. It's part of growing up. You are all babies in Christ. And to be told, if Carrie and I live to 120, which is physically possible, we are still babies in Christ. Some of us don't like that. Are you bitter at others for the wounds they have inflicted on you? If God is sovereign, then he allowed you to be wounded. Have you ever stopped to ask why? The Spirit does not lead us away from trials, but into them to make us stronger. See, the hardest tasks are given only to the most courageous of Christ's soldiers. You will never become better, more godly, unless you see God in it. You'll be left only with bitterness. And that is our option, is it? To become better or bitter? Mm-hmm. You know, are you walking with and by the Spirit or more with your sinful flesh, your emotions? Mm-hmm. Romans eight thirteen says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Mm-hmm. But if you live by the Spirit, you put to death the misdeeds of your body. You will live. For those who are led by the Spirit are children of God. So this being led by the Spirit is a huge issue. Just like being led by the cloud. It was a real distinct difference. The Egyptians followed the Israelites. The Israelites followed the cloud. See, when you follow man, doom is coming. When you follow God, you'll have incredible miracles in your life. Galatians 5.16 says, So I say, walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of your flesh, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what, uh, so that you are, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious: sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before, 
that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. I was thinking about these two passages, and obviously they're put together for a reason. What sins kill the fruit of the Spirit? Well, he's just listed them. Mm. What kills love? Self-idolatry, mm. hatred, discord, mm. jealousy, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, all heart sins. Mm. You cannot love God without loving your brother or sister. Mm. Yeah. God does not feel loved when you mistreat his other children with harshness, coldness, anger and meanness. That doesn't make him feel loved. You're, I love God. Okay, well, you may feel that, but he doesn't feel loved by you when you don't treat your ministry well, your household well, your wife or husband well. What kills joy? All undealt with sin. Isn't it true? You're in sin, you're just like, you're not happy, are you? What kills peace? Undealt with sin. A heart of peace gives you energy, life force. Proverbs 14, 30, a heart of peace gives life to the body. People that lack life force are in sin. It's as simple as that. You can have the most reserved individual. When they come out of the waters, they are pumped. They're pumped. Why? Because they're at peace for the first time in their life. You go, I'm an introvert. No, you're not. You're in sin. The opposite is true for all those twisted up inside for whatever reasons. There's just no life force, is there? What kills forbearance, impatience, leading to anger, fits of rage? These can just be in our hearts and our prayers because we're not courageous enough to verbalize them. Selfish ambition, envy at God's grace on the uh, another stemming from self-righteousness. I can't believe that God is blessing them. What kills kindness? Being in sin. That is when we get unkind to others, isn't it? Envy and jealousy. You mistreat people. Yeah. What kills goodness? Undealt with sin. Especially selfish ambition. Mm. James 4, 3.14 But if you harbour bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast about it or deny the truth. You know, it's funny about selfish ambition. Everybody can see it, but people deny it. Mm. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you'll find disorder and every evil practice. What kills faithfulness? Envy, jealousy, selfish ambition. We lack the faith that God will deal with a situation better than us and take unnecessary action. We get ourselves involved because we believe God is not in there or not willing to get in there. This can be acts or through slander and deception. You know, we can be very emotionally manipulative. We can. And we can do it without even knowing we're doing it sometimes because we're so used to getting things done that way. Mm. What kills gentleness? Again, undealt with sin, selfish ambition, envy, jealousy, fits of rage, hatred, dislike. Let me just say, you don't like somebody, yeah. that is hatred. Yeah. There's only two words in the Bible, love and hate. Mm. I just don't like them. That means you hate them. Being task orientated, not relationship orientated. I can't. I just, I've got to get this done. And we mistreat each other around us. What kills self-control? Selfish ambition with a seasoning of envy and jealousy. James 4.1, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desire that battle within you? You desire what you do not have, so you kill. You cover, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you don't ask God. When you ask, you don't receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend what you have on your pleasures. I think about it. I remember when we were being uh, marked from the churches in uh, Brisbane and uh, Gold Coast. And we were actually really at peace with it. And you have to understand, we didn't know there was a movement. But we didn't fight it because we went, we actually know that we're being spiritual. We've obeyed Matthew 18. We've gone to the leadership three times. We've pulled out and they've said, yeah, we know we're in sin. There's no one to help us. And we followed everything. And we were on our, on our own in our front room. That was a terrifying experience. Yeah. But you know what? There was no selfish ambition. They said, well, you want to take over the church? We had, no, we had no desire to take over the church or be in leadership. We just wanted to see the church righteous. Right. 
And yet we were at peace. We were at peace to look at each other, Carrie and I in the front room and go, honey, this is it. You and me for the rest of our life, if that's what it takes. Because we weren't trying to get anything, make anybody do anything, put other people in us, have a role. If I had wanted to take over the church, there would have been a lot of anger, a lot of justification, a lot of, well, you did this and you did that. And that. I was just like, I just want, I just want to be saved. I just want to die saved. And when you move away from wanting to die saved, that's where all the problems start. Yeah. Point two, are you walking in the light? The pillar of fire was to let Israel always walk in the light. Yeah. So they were always, in the day they walked in the light, and in the night they walked in the light. Mm-hmm. Imagine the amount of light that came out of it. Wow. I mean, we look at the sun, you know, on a hot day, and that's, I don't know how far away, right? Imagine the pillar of fire. Wow. It also put the Egyptians in darkness at night. This is really cool insight. Keeping the Israelites in light, just like the gospel today, it separates us. Mm-hmm. Exodus 14, 19. Then the angel of the Lord, who had been traveling in front of the Israel army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the other side and light to the other side. Mm-hmm. So neither went near the other all night long. So now you've got this thing that on one side gives us enormous light and on the other side, there's darkness. When you think about the plagues, do you remember how darkness came across all the land except for where the Israel... I mean, God is trying to go, look, guys, if you want to know who I'm with... Now imagine this. There are some people in the, the group of Israelites that are actually Egyptians. They've decided to leave with Israel. This is showing the army, guys, you've chosen the wrong side. Mm. I wonder in God's grace whether he allowed a few Egyptians to change side. Or maybe they were just so hard-hearted, so arrogant that they thought they were going to win. But God was really showing every person, I am with this lot and I am not with this lot. That is what the miracles of God show you. I am with this person or I am not with this person. When our ministries grow, God is going, I am with you or I am not with you. And when God is not with you, it needs to do something to you. Notice the Israelites were not to go near the Egyptians at all, as we are not to go near sin. In order to keep walking the light, we must follow Jesus, not simply believe or know him. John 8, 12, when Jesus spoke again to the people, said, I am the light of the world, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. It's not whoever believes in me. It's those who follow me. You need to be going where the Holy Spirit is going. So when we send out the mission teams, we're going where the Holy Spirit opens up the door. If he opens up Singapore, we'll go there. And you know what? If he opens up Pat New Guinea tomorrow, we'll be going there too. And if he opens up and if he closes all the doors, we won't be going there. We go, how do you decide? Well, we have a plan. We've got three missions. Is that where we're going? I don't know. I don't care. It's not my job to figure that out. It's my job to help us raise the money and get the people ready. But if God goes, no, we're going to close that door and we're going to open that door, then that's where we go. Yet I think some of us as Christians, we're terrified of being sent to different places. I will go anywhere but there. I won't go to the third world. I won't go to the first world. I won't go to the second world. I won't go to a place where I don't speak the language. I won't. It's all unreasonable. Only to you. Now, when you look at yourself, your ministry, is everyone wholeheartedly following Jesus? I believe people fall into three categories. There is the sold out. Well, you've got those young Christians that are just moved Buy a lesson and just give a whole load more money. That's a sold out individual. There are the checked out. Mm-hmm. What does checked out mean? To become unfocused or distracted. To cease participating in a meaningful way. Oh, they participate. But their heart is not connected. They're not moved by the sermons. They don't take direction. And that is some of you. And those on the way out. Well, there are people, you can see it on the contribution report or whatever it is. Look no farther than people's contribution to God's kingdom 
or their excitement towards missions for an insight. Checked out. They're not focused on giving. Mm -hmm. They're not. They're focused on their own life. Who will we lose as the pressure of special exposes their heart and they decide it's all too much? So already one of the brothers is like, you can see he didn't give a uh, contribution five weeks ago. He's not giving special. He has it in savings. As we say, why don't you give? And it, now it turns out he doesn't believe who's lost and who's saved. You need to understand how to read your ministry yeah. and learn to deal with it. Who is really going after fishing of men? Who turns up to set evangelism and who is not? And what are you doing about it? That's a, somebody who's not. So I had a chat with one of the brothers said, I hear that you just don't want to come to set evangelism or any evangelism. I said, well, make a decision today or move out the flat and just leave. Because you're accepting the benefits of God and with the brothers, and you're not, you, you know, you're asked to come out evangelizing stuff, you're off to the Blue Mountains, and he goes, I just don't want to evangelize. So we'll make a decision or move out this week. We'll just put you down as a follower. We love you, and, you know, we want to encourage you, but you are taking the benefits of being a Christian, and you're not being a disciple. So just move out, and we'll love you, and, but you're not a disciple. I wasn't me. So just move out. We could use the space. It's that simple. I think about the turnaround in the East. It's because Paul's there. I think everybody has a good heart, but a student ministry needs a man on campus nine till nine. Yeah. Paul works and is out there till 9 p.m. Mm -hmm. and people go, dang, he works and he's doing more than me and I'm a student, I've got all this time. You need to be on campus from nine till nine. Mm -hmm. Look how much fruit changes people. Look at MJ, she is glowing. She came this year, she met somebody, she became a Christian, she's fired up. Every time I see her, I'm looking after her, I'm looking after her. Fruit changes people. Yeah. Now, change people bring fruit, mm -hmm. but fruit also then changes people. Yeah. Now, walking in the light takes constant extreme vulnerability. Wow. Let's talk about it. 2 Corinthians 6.11. We've spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and opened wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. You see that in the ministry. Give your heart to people, but they're just not, it's not coming back. They're not vulnerable. It's what we call the sin of weirdness or the sin of coldness or the sin of hard-heartedness. There's all sorts of stuff going on, but they're just not talking about it. You know, this extreme vulnerability is what most people are just not prepared to do. They are not secure enough and close enough to God to trust in his principles. They are man-focused, not God-focused. They view sharing their weakness as bad or a personally dangerous thing, rather than a spiritually powerful thing. See, you're letting your wounds lead you. Well, I did it in the past and I got wounded, yeah? You're saying it as if that's something wrong. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. A few times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power was made perfect in weakness. Yeah. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that the Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness in insults, in hardship, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I delight in insults. I delight in hardship. I delight in weakness. Bring it on. You give me a difficult situation. I love it. To make yourself vulnerable shows your belief in God being sovereign over your life. It shows your willingness to suffer for others. It's a mark of true love for God and others. In short, it shows just how strong you are spiritually or how weak you are. Yet without vulnerability, the willingness to get hurt, we have bad relationships and remain impure. As we keep poison of evil thoughts in. These evil thoughts and evil thoughts are sin. Mark 7, 21. They need to come into the light. 1 John 1 7 but if we walk in the light as he in the light we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus' son purifies us from all sin 
Otherwise, these sins of evil thoughts towards God and others overtake us. And we feel consumed about where our life is going, becoming even more insecure and man focused. John 12, 35, then Jesus told them, you are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. It's like when you're in sin, when you're living in darkness, you're always like, what's going to happen to my life? Whereas, you know what, when you're completely open and all your sin is out there, everybody will make the best decision on your life based on where you are truly at. And that may not be where you want it. And that's your big feeling. If I get really open, you're like, if I get really open, people are like, I've been immoral. I don't want to tell anybody in the church because then they're going to kick me out of the church. Mm-hmm. Well, let me tell you, if you don't cough it up, God's going to kick you out of the church anyway because he'll cut you out of the church. Yeah. But if you actually confess it, then people can deal with it. You can move on. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not just talking about sexual and rather not bad attitudes, mm-hmm. insecurities, weird, all sorts of evil thoughts. Right. A leader can only make a judgment based on the knowledge he has. So if you don't give them the knowledge about where you're at, you know what? He can't make a good decision. Then you get bitter that they don't make a good decision on your life. And it's because you haven't told them what's going on in your life. (laughs) There is no healing without complete vulnerable confession and no refreshment without repentance. James 5.16, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Healing only comes with confession. Acts 3.19, repent then and turn to God. So that your sins may be wiped out and the times of refreshing may come for the Lord. So there needs to be confession and then repentance. Mm. But so often we don't confess because we go, to be honest, I don't really want to repent. Vulnerability is is essential. It's where growth happens. I've told you before, I don't know if you know how a lobster grows. So basically, as a lobster grows, it grows into its shell. And then as it grows, it feels restricted by its shell. So it actually has to cast off its shell and then it's on the bottom of the ocean with no protection. Mm. It has to live in trust that God has designed it to get rid of its protection in order to grow. Mm. And then God allows another shell to grow out of it. And it continually grows by trusting the principle of making itself vulnerable. Think about how openness and vulnerability of a person at conversion affects the quality of the disciple after conversion. Those who really get in touch with their sinfulness are those who are the most motivated after they are converted. It's why religious people often do so little after they are converted, due to them really believing that they are not that bad. Luke 7, 47, Therefore I tell you, many sins have been forgiven. As a great love is shown, but whoever has been forgiven little loves little. It's why often the church led by ex-pagans. They're super into, I mean, I was a dog of a man. People, why are you motivated? I know exactly who I was and who I am. But honestly, a lot of people come, well, you know, I just needed to change my doctrine. They don't see the sin of omission as being horrendous. They don't see the heart sins of jealousy and ember and all the things they did in their church as wicked sins. Mm. You know, I just wasn't immoral, I didn't get drunk, so I wasn't that bad, I just needed to change my doctrine. And as a result, they're some of the most unloving people in the church. Because oh, yeah. they're religious, they're self-righteous. Mm. Yeah. Jesus grew at Gethsemane and was vulnerable about his innermost feelings, mm. allowing his disciples to hear them. Understand, he went... I am overwhelmed to the point of death. I am struggling with committing suicide. The saviour of the world, a depressive, suicidal person. What do I do with that? He made himself vulnerable to his disciples. The Pharisees' abuses. The Roman governor's authority. Because he trusted in God and it healed us. 1 Peter 2, 23, when they held their insults at him, he did not retaliate when he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins 
and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Vulnerability is the birthplace of love, belonging, joy, encouragement, courage, empathy, and creativity. It is the true source of hope, empathy, accountability that leads to change and authenticity. We all need to not fear man seeing what God sees in us. Struggling along on your own, trying to take control or fix things by your own strength is what got Judas into trouble. He was unopened about his struggles to his peers and it led to his suicide. Conclusion. Are you on the right side of God? God put Israel between a pillar of fire, cloud and fire. Now, point one, to be led by him. Are you being led by God? Point two, to help them walk in the light. Are you really walking in the light? When we get to heaven, there will only be light and full exposure. Revelation 21, 23, the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives it light and the lamp is and the lamb is the lamp. Mm. If you don't get comfortable with being in the light, you will not want to walk into heaven. Yeah. If you don't get comfortable walking in the light on earth, you will never be happy. Yeah. Psalm 89, 15, blessed. Remember that? Mm. Superbly happy. Are those who have learned to acclaim you, who walk in the light of your presence, Lord. Are you known as a happy person? (coughs) Look no further if you are not than your lack of desire to walk vulnerably in the light. Mm -hmm. I'll leave you with a quote by Teddy Roosevelt, a good American president, I believe. (laughs) Quote on daring greatly. He said, it's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how strong, how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena whose face is marred with dust and sweat and blood, who strives vainly, though as, who comes short again and again, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least fails daring greatly. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you today, does your life demonstrate that God is with you or not? Mm-hmm. Amen. Wow.